Most welcome to this event at Bergen Global that we have titled Afghanistan, a graveyard of empires. It should really be with a question mark, but we will come back to that. My name is Anna Strand. I'm a senior researcher here at uh, CMI. And with us today, we have Petter Bert. And one of the reasons that we have this event is because of Petter's book on combining his experience from being an early traveler to Afghanistan as a uh, part of the hippie trail, <clears throat> and some of the reflections he had there, but also later working on Afghanistan mm -hmm. for a number of years with the establishment of the Norwegian Afghanistan Committee, and also later in Mura. And then we are stretching this a bit, because Petter has also worked in Ukraine. Um, so we are trying, when we come a bit out and in, to make some comparison between what has been the, call it a failure of Afghanistan to what is the situation in Ukraine, because there are so many connections between the two countries and between the massive international support going. Also an opportunity to discuss a bit, but what makes Ukraine different, if different? Uh, <clears throat> but I thought I'll, I'll, I'll start a bit with um, a brief introduction of what we implies when we talk about a graveyard of empires. The empires we are talking about is Great Britain and the three Anglo-Afghan wars, as it's mm -hmm. been termed, from 1849 <clears throat> to 42, 78 to 80, and then back in 1919, when there was an agreement made in Rawalpindi between the British and Afghanistan. Now, <clears throat> this was very much connected with uh, the, call it the, the British-Russian empire's struggle over power in, in Central Asia. So Afghanistan was a, was a part of that. Then we are talking about Soviet Union and their invasion in 1979 that lasted until 1989, where they came in and somehow should rescue what was set out as a modernization program with the communists taking power in, in Kabul and which then ended up as being much more than it became the Cold War, an example of the Cold War. And then we have US-NATO coming in in 2001, where uh, after Al-Qaeda's attack in the United States and where Taliban was then hosting Al-Qaeda leaders and the international invention with NATO mandated uh, support, that lasted until 2021. But the thing just to mention already now, because these empires do still exist, but somehow in a different form. But the one who have really struggled after each of these inventions, especially after the in, back in 89 and, and now, is the Afghans, because the first withdrawal ended up in a civil war with a massive loss of life. The second withdrawal ended up with the Taliban coming back in power. So it's, it's also a question about why have these attempts also that's included state building failed that we will come back to. Another, to me, interesting but a complicating factor is then also the, the ethnical and religious diverse societies that Afghanistan is, uh, where the majority, but, but let's be honest, because nobody knows how many lives in Afghanistan because there has no, been no census since 1973. And then it was by plane. So the division between the numbers and the division between the different ethnic groups is more a negotiated uh, agreement rather than a, a firm knowledge about it. But the largest ethnic group are the Pashtuns. That was also a larger group in Pakistan. Then you have the Tajiks up north. You have Uzbeks up north. You have uh, the Hazaras, which is the Shia minority living in central Afghanistan, and then a number of smaller ethnic groups as well. And I'll, I'll challenge Petr a bit about the history, because some of these groups are then somehow being left behind, being it from Alexander the Great or being from Genghis Khan. So that's also part of the story. So, so this is also, I think we start before going into the different time periods, maybe a bit about the history, because that's what you have dwelled a lot upon on, in your presentation and your book. Yeah, it started out, I mean, the book started in, I, or I got the 
uh, idea or was uh, uh, in a way challenged to look into the history uh, more in depth uh, after a long talk with a lot of young people in Herat in 2011. And they said that uh, when we're going to talk about what is the glue of Afghanistan, what binds this very, very diversified country together, why hasn't it been split up? Since most of the ethnic groups, they have their brothers and sisters on the other side of the border, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, and so on. And then they said, you have to look into the history, the proud history of Afghanistan. And then I said, hey, what is that? Well, that is the history before 1747, which was the year when Afghanistan was established by the Pashtuns. And then I started to dig and was digging all the way back to the first uh, city civilizations in the world, the Indus civilization, the Sumer in, the bet in between uh, Tigris and Euphrat, and also the Nile. And then we are several thousand years back in history. And Afghanistan has been, in a way, on the crossroad between these different civilizations, especially Sumer and Indus. And uh, in addition, the Pashtuns, they trace their origin back to the Nile. If that is true or not, no one will find out. But this is their, in a way, uh, the history they tell. Uh, and uh, when you then start from the first empire, the first Persian empire, different Persian empires, you have all the caliphates, you have, as you mentioned, Alexander the Great from Macedonia coming in 330 before our, uh, I mean, before z uh, year zero. Uh, you had uh, Genghis Khan coming in uh, 1230 approximately from the east. And they bring all these different empires that have, in a way, had influence of the whole of Afghanistan, of what is today Afghanistan, or part of it. It is tremendous how many. And coming with different state building traditions, different uh, religions, different, I mean, all these different uh, experiences that these, these empires brought with them, that Afghanistan have, in a way, made uh, their own. So there is a lot of imp external impulses that is part of what is Afghanistan today, and that became very interesting. Uh, from the caliphates and from the Persian empires, you had a very decentralized state structure. From Genghis Khan, you had a very centralized uh, state structure. And Afghanistan today is a uh, some kind of a conflict between a decentralized and a centralized state structure. Uh, it was uh, the Iron Amir or Abdurrahman Khan uh, from 1880 till 1901, who was in a way the, the, the Amir that said, hey, this should be a very centralized state. And the Amirs and kings since have tried to do the same. The Bonn Conference in 2001, uh, as after the attack on the New York and uh, Washington, uh, where the so-called uh, winners, uh, everyone except Taliban, was part of this conference in Bonn. They also agreed on a strong centralized state. But what do we see? A very fragmented Taliban taking over, and we are back to the very decentralized state. And the interesting thing is that the former president of the United States, Mr. Trump, in 1920, no, 2020, uh, established uh, what they call the Afghan Study Group to try to look into what are the strategic interests of the uh, strategic security interests of the United States withdrawing from Afghanistan. And then came up with two, in particular, two issues. One thing was Afghanistan has a tradition of a decentralized state. And the other thing was Afghanistan has old traditions that Alexander the Great experienced 330 years before our, uh, before year zero. 
that uh, they have a tra democratic tradition. And these were highlighted by this Afghan study group established by the Congress in the US giving their report in February 2021, soon two years ago. So it tells something about how the long history actually is quite important to understand the country. When Norwegian militaries are proud that they have a looking back to 2001, I mean, uh, hey, where are we? I mean, it's totally bullshit. We need to go much further back to understand a country because these impulses is tremendously important. And that is actually what inspired me to, uh, to write the book and try to collect all the, as much of, of this information as possible to try to understand how the state of Afghanistan as it is today is constructed. What kind of impulses is within that state that actually both make it a unified state but at the same time, a state with a lot of internal contradictions, including the ethnic and the religious. But maybe we can cover this a little bit with how then democracy was uh, somehow, that this type of democracy was introduced, just so we are clear on that, so we can follow that up on during the different periods, because it's not how we are thinking about it today, here in Norway, but it had a different, more local connotation, didn't it? It was the Pashtuns that established the Jirga, and this is what Alexander the Great experienced 330 years before year zero. And uh, when he uh, learned about these Jirgas, he said to his uh, generals that, hey, these look like our uh, Greek city-state, or uh, I mean the police, the city-states in Greece, that is the base for our democracy. So he said, we have to respect them. And I mean, these Jirgas are still existing and it is, uh, and basically it is an assembly of all men. As we have seen in many societies, it is the men that actually are allowed to have a say. In Greece, it was limited uh, based on, you had land. There was a certain criteria for what me which men could participate in the police. In uh, the Dirgas, it was all Pashtun men, basically. Then, of course, there were uh, there were uh, slightly different. Someone had more possibilities than others. But the British historian Tom Holland wrote a book about the Persian Wars, where he mentioned the battle between the Persians and the and Athens in the Thermopyl and where he uh, concludes that if the Athens hadn't won in Thermopyl, our democracy wouldn't have developed. The question I raise, hey, okay, if the Persians had won in Thermopyl, perhaps the democracy had developed from Afghanistan. Because I mean, you had the same structures and you will find it in a lot of tribal societies around in the world, these type of, what should we say, uh, assembly of people together to give advice to make um, decisions on crucial issues. But then <clears throat> another issue here is actually that this kind of structure, often referred to as Pashtun Wali, then both were a, a kind of driving force and, and guidance and also a conflict resolution mechanism among the Pashtuns. But throughout history, the Pashtuns have also with some exceptions being in charge of, of the Afghan state. So how have they combined this tribal governance with the governance of a number, as we saw, different ethnic and religious groups? This is also a threat of conflict that has been going through since the British, I would say, at least. Oh, I guess it started before, but I mean, in, especially after 1747, uh, the Afghan state was established as some kind of a uh, empire building state. And uh, that's when they took control of a uh, great part of today Pakistan and also part of today's India, Kashmir, and so on. And that was their controlled territory for some decades. They taxed it and they had the winter capital in Peshawar in today's Pakistan. 
and uh, so on. And that was the Pashtuns that at, during the same period took control of the northern part of what is today Afghanistan with the Turkmens, the Tajiks, uh, the Uzbeks. And then in 1880s, took control of Hazarashat, the central area of Afghanistan, and also what we today call Nuristan, which was Kafiristan uh, in the very east. And uh, that was used with military power and also allocating land to the, especially the Pashtun warriors that participated in these military expeditions. They got land in these areas as a reward. And that was also used later on uh, in battles against these ethnic minorities that uh, the Pashtuns actively uh, allocated the land from the locals to their own people. They also established pockets of Pashtuns along the border in the north, in where the Turkmens and the Uzbeks and the Tajiks were living to control the, the, the outer border of the country. But then if, if we jump a bit, because after the, call it, <coughs> Britain had agreed with an agreement, there was a long lineage of male kings and the same family that attempted modernization at some stages, but then had a pushback from, I would say, the more conservative religious elements. Mm -hmm. So it has been all, all the kind of struggle between modernization, including women rights, and call it the tribal, more conservative societies. But this has been really a, a damaging struggle as well on how far you could go into modernization. I mean, the whole situation of women in Afghanistan has become in a way, uh, how, a way of measuring how modern is the society. And of course, this has to do with women being totally invisible or being part of society, being visible, being active participants and so on. Uh, if you go back to the 13th, 14th century, you had outstanding women in part of Afghanistan that was rulers. So there's a history here where women have played an active role, for example, in Herat, in the western part of Afghanistan, as <clears throat> rulers uh, getting uh, uh, collecting a lot of uh, I mean outstanding scientific uh, scientific uh, I mean philosophers historians etc cetera, etc cetera, and establishing a very intellectual uh, prosperous environment and then in the 1880s <coughs> the iron Amir he made actually the first uh, legal change to the benefit of women when the rule which has existed in many countries that if uh, a women, woman become widow, she has to marry with one of the brothers of the deceased husband. This is not an uncommon rule. And this had to do with social security. But that rule was abolished in Afghanistan in the 1880s. Then in 1920s, uh, the, his grandson, King Amanullah, uh, and his wife, Soroya, they established the first school for girls. They promoted girls going to university. They banned the whale on the uh, public, ser uh, public servants, in particular the upper echelon. And what happened then was that the king had to uh, leave his position in 1929 because of tribal and religious conservative leaders making revolt. The um, reforms continued, but um, at a much slower pace. During the 30, 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, in the 1960s, you had a so-called democratic uh, wave with establishing political parties, newspapers, and so on. Uh, but the next push for modernization that actually was 
particularly focused on women, was with the uh, pro-Soviet party, the PDPA, taking power in April 1978, pushing for female education, land reform, industrialization, and then since they didn't succeed, they got a lot of opposition, the Soviet invasion in 79, which added to the opposition because then in addition to modernization came a foreign intruder and you got the Mujahideen. And 10 years of internal battle against the Soviets. And uh, the result, a Mujahideen government in 1992, which was as conservative as the Taliban taking over in 1996 when it came to women issues. Then came the Americans and NATO in 2001, actually with more or less the same program. Female education, which was high on the agenda, not the least for Norway and some other countries, but also after some time for the Americans. And a lot of the same, I mean, economic developments, democrat democracy, etc. And we know the result. Uh, more and more opposition, partly because of the issue of modernization, conservative, religious, tribal uh, forces opposing, and then in addition, the foreign forces and their, how they behaved, and also how the security forces of the Afghan authorities behaved, added to the opposition, and today we are back with the Taliban in the driving seat. So, yeah. But, but if we wind a bit back, because dwelling a bit about the 70s, because that was also when this turned into, I would define it as an ideological battle. You had, in a sense, uh, what was happening in Iran that somehow influenced mm -hmm. on, on development of the region. Um, you had Muslim Brotherhood that had an influence at the universities. As you said, the Soviet communists started to make the mark as well. The, China, the Maoists had also a kind of a very strong presence at the universities. Mm -mm. Now, the government didn't like the, the Muslim Brotherhood, so they were forced, when they were trying to make revolt at the uh, university, they were forced to Pakistan yeah. and started to get support from Pakistan, who has historically also had a conflict with, uh, with Afghanistan. So, so they, in a sense, what same later were... Uh, Talk, talked about as the Mujahideen heroes, they were in a sense a startup with a strong uh, Pakistani support and, and influence. So, so it was all of this kind of breaking between, call it Islam and communism, that was somehow a kind of dividing the societies as well. And when the uh, Soviet Union decided to invade, in a sense, I would argue that they did it so to, to, to save their own revolution, an Afghan revolution, from avoiding becoming a bloodbath because of internal struggle, mm -hmm. but also this modernization project. And it, it became then, this became the war, the Cold War as middle of that, with all our support, US support, Saudi support, being poured into Afghanistan, primarily through Pakistan. Mm -hmm. So it, in, in a sense, a proxy war between the West, as we see a bit now in, in Ukraine, but, but really a lot of effort going into it, into this, to make it even more complicated, become, this become a rallying point in the Islamic world as well. And gentlemen called Osama bin Laden, but not only him, a lot of Muslims came to defend the Afghans against communism. This was the ground and starting point of Al-Qaeda, the base. So it was, it was all put into this, and then when the Soviet decided to leave, it was all kept in Afghanistan, and as it ended into to a civil war. But some of these failures were also then propping up the Islamists that we did on purpose. Social Democratic Party, other parties were not approved. They were not giving support. They were not allowed to function. They were kept, a lot of them. So in, in a sense, the way Afghanistan has been shaped, has been also been very much on purpose, supporting the part, not asking any questions about their intentions or attitude towards women, as long as they were fighting mm -hmm. Soviet Union. Would no, you I'm... share that uh, reflection? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, that was, uh, I mean, Afghanistan was, as I see it, during the this period from 78, or actually from before 78, because Saud King, who was the president from 73, uh, who actually relied on the pro-Soviet party at that time when he got into power, but had to, in a way, uh, move more back to the tribal uh, support when he got more and more in trouble before he was killed in 78. Uh, this, uh, I mean, Afghanistan became, in a way, a tool used by the West against Soviet Union as more or less the last leg of the Cold War. Because, I mean, uh, the Soviet support to the Afghan government, well, Soviet withdrew 15th of February 89, but the support to the Afghan government continued till Soviet uh, vanished in 2001. And the pro-Soviet government in Afghanistan was uh, history in early uh, 2000, no, 1992. Uh, and I mean, the same was with the uh, international and the, the American and NATO invasion or in, incursion in uh, 2001, again, it was Afghanistan used as a battleground for the war against terror. And you, if you go backwards, you see the same with uh, the ri rivalry between uh, Great Britain, the British Empire, and Tsar Russia. But Afghanistan became the buffer between the two. Uh, but it was also a battleground where both the British and Russia tried to get influence in Afghanistan because Afghanistan was, in a way, uh, a crossroad in many ways between Central Asia and South Asia, the Far East and the Middle East. And, I mean, the Silk Road, it was a trading uh, and, in a way, a battleground in many ways for all these different regimes up through the history. So it was strategically very important. And that's why Afghanistan looks at it is with this tiny uh, strip of land towards the Chinese border. That was because Tsar Russia and British India should not have common border. Uh, so in a way, Afghanistan has been in a way in the wrong place at the wrong time continuously down through history or at least through the last uh, 150, 200 years, with this rivalry between different empires. And uh, that has been, in a way, their bad luck. Uh, and I think it's important to remember that the ba these battles, they have mainly been fought by outsiders. The Afghans have been the victims. But they remain with internal strifes, con uh, uh, that uh, has been has been and still is difficult to, difficult to solve, both of ethnic, religious, political uh, with political base. So uh, the international community owe Afghanistan a lot based on how Afghanistan has been used as a battleground. But let's let's come back to that. Uh, just a reminder: if you're following in on on Zoom, you are most welcome to pose questions there as well. We will also open up for questions a bit later here, uh, with the with the audience. Uh, but to me, there was also this 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 question because, as you say, Afghans have been divided. There was a Pashtun leader of of the Soviet supported state. There were primarily Pashtun leaders of the resistance. Different ethnic groups have been on all sides, so there is there is no clear cut uh, division between uh, uh, on ethnicity or on either on religion. It's been somehow on, on on different sides of the conflict. But I think it's also important, as you say, because in ninety one, when the U.S. saw the the business finished and the Soviet Union out and more or less in, in a state of disintegration, all support was cut, and they. Mm -hmm withdraw, as they have done just now. So the Afghans were left with um, a lot of guns, a lot of divisions, and they ended up in, in a bloody civil war, probably the most bloody we've seen over Kabul. 
with ethnic massacres of, from Tajiks doing against the Zaras, the Zaras against the others. So, so it, it all ended up in a kind of, of battle. And But part of this was also that during this conflict, they had all received support from the neighboring countries and being tied up, being it to Iran or being it to Pakistan. So it, it was a kind of a kind of, of, of a mess being left behind. Mm -hmm. But the only one that continued support were the Europeans and Saudi, some limited time. But it, it was really just leaving them there and then sort it out for themselves. Is that, would you say, a correct observation? Yeah, because, I mean, what, what did we leave behind? You, you say a lot of weapons, but we also left behind, I mean, the Mujahideen period during the Soviet invasion and the war against the Soviets, the last leg of the Cold War, you developed a lot of new leaders in Afghanistan that was not traditional leaders. There were people that had managed to, in a way, establish themselves because they managed to get support, armament, money from through Pakistan mainly. Uh, that could be from Saudi, from the Americans, from China, from Britain, from a lot of different countries that channel uh, funds through the Pakistanis. And these new leaders around in Afghanistan, when the money and the weapons dried up after the collapse of the Soviet Union in 91, then it was a question, how do they uh, manage to, uh, in a way, support their barriers, their small armies? They had to start uh, taxing people who were traveling through their area, and they had the weapons to actually force people to pay. Traders that were coming with commodities were forced to pay, and there was a lot of atrocities towards civilians, and it was uh, a rape outside Herat, no, outside Kandahar, that actually was the, what initiated the establishment of what became Taliban. Because that was religious leaders in that local area that said, hey, this cannot continue. So they used their um, influence over the local people to actually mobilize against uh, these uh, local warlords. And through the whole southern Afghanistan, Taliban managed, in a way, to take control with very little resistance. It was first when they came to Kabul in 1996, they, uh, they uh, suddenly faced a huge city with a lot of different ethnic groups, a totally different way of living compared to the countryside, and the conflict started with how should women uh, behave, should women be out or at home, and all these traditional attitudes in many ways. And then, of course, when they started towards the northern part of Afghanistan, you got also the battles towards other ethnic groups. And, but it's important to remember that Taliban is actually a result. They came out from the Mujahideen and the religious forces. So the, it's the continuation here. Uh, and at the same time, they came out as a reaction to the consequence of these 10 years of battles against the Soviet Union and the uh, rising of new, in a way, illegal or illegitimate local leaders that had established themselves outside the traditional system. Yeah, and, and two observations, because in the beginning, Taliban was also welcome because they said they were not going to govern. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, I was in Kabul, or I was just outside of Kabul when, when they captured this, their capital, mm -hmm. and people were cheering them because they thought it was the king that would come back, normality being brought back. Mm -hmm. An interesting part, <coughs> those warlords that they had popular support to send out of the country, those were the ones that we brought back in 2001 and put into governance positions. Mm -hmm. Not very liked by Afghans, but that became then part of the Cheta complete. That was the Afghan state, together with a lot of the staff for the NGO sector and UN agencies that spoke English and should manage the new state. So the starting point of the second state that then was set, where I don't know how many billions has been spent on state building and democratization and elections. I must quote a former student of us who said that democracy was very nice before we had elections. 
So it, it's some of these visions of Afghanistan that was built up that somehow was squandered in the way the state was structured. Mm -hmm. The parliament was made as weak as possible because th really this was a war on terror. And at least for a large number of years, US didn't want to have any kind of state that could pose a challenge to uh, trying to trace down Osama bin Laden and Al Qaeda. So it was a lot of competing objectives from the very start. Yes, and at the same time also tremendously lack of knowledge, of understanding of Afghanistan. And uh, this uh, Sharan, Timur Sharan, who has re just recently published a book on the um, um, this uh, very special uh, society that Afghanistan is established, like a network society. I mean, it's a very weak state. And that has been all along. Even if they have tried to use very, I mean, strong military means to uh, keep the state. But it is based on a lot of networks where actually the center, the Amir or the king, or later on the presidents, they've always had to have some kind of a balancing act towards all kind of local leaders. They needed resources to allocate to the local leaders to have loyalty. In the beginning, that was the result of war booties from the Indian Plains. When they lost the Indian Plains uh, in the beginning of the 18th century, they had, they relied on money from the British. The British pumped in quite a lot of money to try to keep uh, Afghanistan uh, away from the British uh, crown colony. And uh, it has been taxing, it has been a different kind of uh, income they have had. Then you have had from the Soviets and then recent period, you have had international money uh, through development aid, military support, et cetera, et cetera, in the last 20 years that have been used exactly the same way. So this, this network society where the leader, be it Ashraf Ghani, Karzai, or previous people, they have, everyone have had to, in a way, keep this kind of negotiating balance between the central leadership and the local leaders. And uh, that the international community never have understood. They thought that we build up with a parliament, et cetera, and centrally. But I mean, this parliament functioned as part of this network society. It was all these informal connections that actually decided how the parliament voted and not uh, political parties or, uh, I mean, women in the parliament. Yes, they had. 30, 30 or 33 percent women due to quotation. But so it was one of the uh, really strong women caucuses in a parliament internationally. But these women was not, uh, had no particular uh, support for women issues necessarily because they voted according to the network. So this way, in a way, you had a society that acted completely different from how the international community thought a uh, society should function. So it was a mismatch from one end to the other. Mm -hmm. And that is the situation today. And I think uh, that is what we totally lost out on, was our total lack of understanding how Afghanistan is composed, how, how, how it has been functioning. and. Uh, this total, in a way, the international community, be it the Soviet Union during 79, 89, and actually up to 92, or US NATO from 2001 till 21, they have been in the driving seat. They have, in a way, put the framework for what is going to be done, where is money going to be allocated, what kind of institutions, how are they going to function? It's not been the Afghans. I mean, Karzai, and not the least, Ashraf Ghani, the last president before Taliban takeover, they were seen as Sosha, who was the Amir uh, who was put on the throne by the British in 1838. 
He was thrown out by the Afghans in 1842 when the British had their first defeat. And he was hanged in Kabul. Both Karzai and Ashraf Ghani has been compared to Sarsoja. And what is being said by people who were close to Ghani that in the last weeks before the fall of Afghanistan in uh, August two years ago, no, one year ago, a little bit more than one year ago, uh, he was uh, very obsessed with Sarsoja and his uh, uh, what happened to him and also what happened to Najibullah, the last uh, president during the pro-Soviet time who went into the UN uh, uh, offices and stayed there from 92 till 96 when the Taliban took over, dragged him out of the office, hanged him in a lamp pole in Kabul. But Afghani was afraid that that should happen. Yeah, and this, too. this, this was for them a, a kind of nice uh, going into Ukraine because really the state collapsed when Ashraf Ghani got himself into a helicopter and left Afghanistan. Yeah. Military forces saw no need to fight. There were no in command. So why should they sacrifice their life when the, when the president had this job? But what we have seen in Ukraine is rather different. And because there was a president that stood up, that uh, despite attacks on the capital, defended the country. He was on Twitter, he was on social media, he was on television every day, standing as a very strong contrast, which many Afghans now are blaming Ashraf Ghani. But let, let's go a bit into Ukraine, because in, in one sense, it's a country like Afghanistan that we have poured military support into. We have going in, NATO is giving a strong backing against now Russia, not Soviet Union. And uh, we have promised um, rebuilding of the country long before the conflict is over. So, so we are using some of the same tools that was used in Afghanistan. But is there a likelihood that this could end up as badly as we've just discussed for Afghanistan now? Or do you see signs that Ukraine should or could be different? Have we learned, have the Ukrainians learned something about how not to pursue a war and assistance? I mean, I came to Ukraine first time in 2015 and started working there summer to 16 at the Norwegian embassy. And uh, I had a crush co course with the deputy at the embassy in uh, July uh, uh, 16, since I had no background from the country about economy, policy, history, and all these things. And after a few days, I said, hey, this reminds me of Afghanistan. And uh, this deputy at the embassy, he looked at me and said, hey, what, do you, uh, what is this? I mean, everyone thinks that Afghanistan and Ukraine is two totally different countries. Yes, they are different, both in size and in history and everything. But they have some striking similarities. And both countries are what I would call this kind of network society. The state has a very, very low standing. Uh, it has been looked upon, both in Afghanistan and Ukraine, as some kind of a playground of certain uh, well-connected uh, uh, individuals at the top level. Oligarchs in Afghanistan, warlords, uh, some uh, religious leaders, and so on in Afghanistan. And these networks have been, in a way, what everything has been about. The state has had, uh, is, you cannot compare it to our state, which has a, a much, much stronger legitimacy um, in, among people. Uh, so, uh, and then Ukraine is also this kind of country in between, <coughs> buffer between different empires, the Ottoman Empire, the Russian Tsar Empire, uh, Lithuania, Poland, Austria, Hungary, uh, Mongols have been there too, like in Afghanistan. So in a way, it's also a lot of impulses from different uh, uh, directions that have come into Ukraine up through history. The Scandinavians have been very important in Ukraine and its development. So. 
that way you see a lot of similarities. Uh, another striking difference, because now I'm diving into the Ukrainian history to try to understand more of the long history. And back in approximately 880, what we know as Kiev Rus was established. And uh, that was one of the biggest uh, countries or empires in Europe at that time. Kivrus was established with quite some influence uh, from uh, Scandinavian Vikings. And the one who was the emperor 1,000 years ago, Yaroslav, he was the father-in-law of Harald Hårdåde. Uh, his uh, daughter, Elisi, was married to Harald Hårdåde. And uh, his wife, Ingjerd Olufsdottir, she was the aunt of Olav den Hellige, Olav the Saint. Uh, so, and also other Norwegian Viking leaders have been in and through Ukraine on their way to Constantinople or uh, Miklagar, uh, which was impo an important city in Europe at that time. They traveled on the rivers. So, and what was left behind from this period was, again, type of democratic tradition with this kind of advisory councils and so on that was established with participation from basically the male population. But it was this type of thing similar to the Jirgas in a way in Afghanistan. What happened then in 1230 or 1240 was that Genghis Khan and his warriors came to Kiev and they destroyed Kiev which was the center of Kiev Rus. But they didn't destroy Kiev Rus, but it was more fragmented. The different parts of the, that empire was in a way much more self-governed. And one of the elements of Kiev Rus was what became the Moscow uh, kingdom, later to become the Tsar Russia. Moscow was a tiny, uh, local little village in part of Kivros at that time. And uh, what these historians say is that the Mongols had a tremendous influence on what became the Moscow Kingdom, which developed a very autocratic way of ruling, which they brought from China. While the rest of Kivros came under the influence of Lithuania, Poland, and later on part of it under Hungaria, uh, uh, Hungarian, uh, the, these different Central European empires. They managed to keep these democratic traditions, even in, within these empires, even if they tried to have a more centralized uh, govern, governance system, they never managed to kill these traditions that Kiev Rus had developed. And that's why Ukraine today and Russia today is so different. Ukraine has always been leaning towards the Western part of Europe, while Russia has been much more leaning towards the East. And with the autocratic rule, I mean, uh, the Tsar, as well as Putin, which he has uh, Peter the uh, the uh, great, uh, the Tsar Peter the Great, as one of his uh, inspiring uh, ideals. They, that tells something about the conflict that is going on now. For Russia, Ukraine is part of Russia. While the Ukrainians say, hey, we are not part of Russia, we are something else. We have a long tradition of being independent from Russia. And that's what we want to continue with and link up more to the Western Europe, where we have much more connections. So that is, uh, in a way, where part of the same players that has been in Afghanistan also play a vital role when it comes to the development of what is today Ukraine and what is today Russia. But your reading is that that is putting then Ukraine today in a better position than Afghanistan has been to be in charge of their own development. 
and being kind of resisting the pressure that comes from the military invasion from, from Russia at the moment? Or is that too simplistic? To... I mean, one important difference, as I see it, is in Afghanistan, all the way through, both during the Soviet period and the uh, US NATO period from 2001 till 21, it has been the foreigners that has been in the driving seat. The different uh, leaders, Afghan leaders, they have been more or less uh, puppets. And that's how people have been looking upon them. In Ukraine, that is totally different. I mean, the Ukrainians have been in the driving seat from the beginning. It is the Ukrainian forces that are fighting the, uh, the, the Russian forces. They, got, they get support, military support from the international community, but they are in the driving seat they do not share information as, hey, where are our, how do we assess the situation? And they share some information, but a lot of is kept secret, so no one exactly knows, and there is a lot of speculation, but the Ukrainians have a close uh, follow-up of uh, their military forces, where they uh, are going to have the next offensive, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think this is your ownership of the processes, both the issue of fighting corruption, fighting nepotism, fighting oligarchs, as the Ukrainians are doing now in parallel with waging a war, a defense war. They are also fighting corruption, which to me is incredible. But this is by their own force. And that, I think, this ownership issue is tremendously important, which makes a difference uh, so big between Afghanistan and Ukraine, and which is important as an, a warning to us that we should not try to take over what the Ukrainians are doing now. Because when they are in charge, they will also know how to develop this based on the experience, the history of, of Ukraine, and to make the result of this uh, freedom battle uh, victorious, both for Ukraine, but also then for the rest of us, because that would then uh, safeguard these values that we have in common. And we have them in common, not only through a recent period since Ukraine got its uh, independence in 91, but we have it in common for more than a thousand years. That we also forget. These are the long historic lines that we set out to discuss today. But, <laughs> but I think for the sake of time, we are soon running out. Is there anyone in the, in the audience that would like to have a comment or, or a question to Peter? Anna, please. Thank you, and thank you for this uh, tour of Afghan and uh, also uh, recent U or Ukrainian history. I want to raise one question. I was reminded when you spoke about uh, that book by Svetlana Alexievich uh, of, from Afghanistan, the, the Coffins of Sink. Yeah. And then I was thinking, how, how does war end? <laughs> how, w w what we like to think there are negotiated solutions. There's, Arna was saying, like democracy building, millions of dollars for equality and all of that. But there is also this element of just fatigue that especially Afghanistan is such a long, on all sides, even Taliban shows uh, symptoms of fatigue in a way. But in the Ukraine, of course, it's still like eight, nine months. And I was wondering if you see any any signs of this or any comparisons there that can point towards an end? Uh, otherwise, I agree fully with the point of not having like a Western I insertion into a driving seat, of course. I mean, just to, to start out with Afghanistan, I think uh, what is important now, given that, okay, Taliban have come back, and I'm not astonished that they came back, given how we have uh, mismanaged uh, our uh, role in Afghanistan during decades. 
uh, now the important thing is that the Afghans will have to take the responsibility to wage this internal war, I mean, not war in uh, warfare, but uh, uh, ideological uh, value war uh, within the society to actually uh, pave the way forward, uh, what kind of society Afghanistan is going to be, including the role of women and so on. That has to be uh, waged by the Afghans in Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, when it comes to Ukraine, uh, well, you don't see fatigue in the way you see it in Afghanistan. And of course, this has to do with people feel that, hey, this is totally unjust. Why should we be swallowed by Russia? I mean, there's no, we have, uh, I mean, Ukrainians have now united more than ever in their, in a way, nation building project which they have been engaged in since 91 to unite these different parts of the country under one banner and uh, for certain values i mean people who have had uh, uh, russian as their mother tongue uh, have in a way more or less completely uh, stopped doing that and use ukrainian now because of the war uh, there is approximately 17 percent of the uh, inhabitants in Ukraine is Russian by uh, by uh, definition, uh, but I mean, this divisions between East and West is also nearly gone now because of the Russian invasion. Because yes, there has been uh, different attitudes towards the use of language and so on, but the issue of being taken swallowed by Russia that is a no starter. And uh, what the, the Ukrainians have stated very clearly, and I think it's quite a uh, strong agreement in the country about that, is that there is no negotiations before all the, the, all the land that has been captured by Russia since 2014 is returned, including Crimea. Crimea has only land connection from Ukraine. It is a peninsula from Ukraine. So, I mean, that Khrushchev uh, handed it over from the Russian uh, uh, Soviet Republic to the Ukrainian Soviet Republic in 1954. Yes, that is what he did. But I mean, geographically, it was only natural because that is the linkage. And uh, of course, then came the Black Sea fleet of the, the uh, the Russians, that is on Crimea, but they have totally undermined the possibility to continue with that. So, I mean, in a way, Russia has lost their possibility to get very much positive treatment by the Ukrainians uh, in any kind of negotiations when all the land captured have been liberated. So that's where we are, I think, at the moment. We will see. But can I follow up? Because there was a second dimension to Anna's question, and that is how do you end the war? Uh, because if we take the first period in, in Afghanistan, Soviet Union moved already in 83 to informal channels, talk to the Americans, saying that, well, I think we, we would like to retreat there. Uh, can we end this? And the Americans said, no way. Because they saw it as a possibility mm -hmm. to really inflict heavy losses. Are we in the same position with Ukraine as well, because now the empire of the Soviet Union disintegrated. Now, really, Russia is challenged as a military power. How much appetite is there to see an end to this? How much is can Ukraine be used, not for the, for the sake of Ukraine, but for the sake of, again, inflicting a bit of wounds on, on Russia? And how can you come out of this with an explanation saying that well, we are retreating. We have not really lost, but we have decided to go back. Is there a point here of no return for the peace in Europe in the longer run? Again, I think that the ownership is tremendously important because, as I mean, I think the Ukrainians, as they have uh, stood steadfast till now in their battle for their uh, national sovereignty attempts by 
the Americans or other external forces to try, to, for example, to force the Ukrainians into negotiations with Russia before their conditions have been fulfilled will be very difficult. Uh, the Afghans were much more, in a way, victims of the outsiders' decisions, as with the mm -hmm. Trump going into uh, negotiations with Taliban in uh, 2019, uh, resulting in this agreement of withdrawal. So I think there also that the Ukrainians are much better positioned through the way that the whole conflict has developed during these nine months, or actually since 2014. But they have, in particular, during these nine months, positioned themselves in a st so strong position that it will be very difficult for the international community to force them into, for example, giving up Crimea or uh, so on. I mean, I don't foresee that that will happen in uh, the foreseeable future. But instead, now, the latest, uh, in a way, rumors say how much real you could relate to that is difficult to say, but is that the war might end by the spring next year with the liberation of Crimea. Of course, this is based on what happened with Kherson, which I visited together with the guy sitting behind here in summer uh, 2020. Uh, and uh, where the Russians had to leave the city, even if this was one of the capitals of the provinces that Russia had annex annexed, and say, this is part of Russia. So it's a big question mark how they uh, withdraw further. And there are rumors that they have actually withdrawn from parts of the eastern side of the river also. Uh, so we will see what will happen in the weeks to come, because then suddenly the fresh water support to Crimea might be cut again, because that's a channel from just north of Kherson, north, north east of Kherson. There is a big channel going to Crimea. So and I think we end on that note. History continues, so probably we are back. It it's continues, it. but it has also roots In hundreds, history. if not thousands of years back, which might be of importance, not because history repeats itself, but it leaves traces that is important for how a society is functioning today and how it might develop. And I see a further discussion that we probably should pick up on as well, because you mentioned Genghis Khan and the Mongols coming in. Well, China is uh, emerging on, on our own screen today as well, as maybe a larger threat than, than Russia. So uh, history might repeat itself there as well. I think welcome back to further discussion here at Bergen Global, and we have quite a lot to, to untangle when it comes to international developments. We will Thank you, Peter. Thank you.